While I'll be doing my best to edit around it, this video contains a lot of flashing lights and rapid movements that may cause harm to those with photo or motion sensitivity. Viewer discretion is advised. Borderlands 2 is often called many things. When it comes to the endgame though, the community seems to have more or less decided on the word unfair. Similarly, when it comes to the age-old console wars, the consensus seems to be the mouse and keyboard is simply better for aiming and shooting in games like this. Well, how about we take some time to upset both camps? This is Borderlands 2 with no neck. Now, what does that mean? Well, you can aim via the right analog stick, mouse, even keyboard, or if you're feeling like giving yourself motion sickness, motion controls. I won't be using any of them or any unlisted method or directly controlling things in a conventional fashion. See, for those that prefer gamepads like myself, many games give the option of aim assist. When you aim down sights, or ADS, the camera will shift a little toward the center of mass of the enemy that you have within your reticle. There are exceptions to that, but we'll get there. The camera will also move downward when you're in fight for your life. It's not particularly helpful, but is technically an option available. This does mean you need to revive yourself before death, and the side-to-side -side drift that it gives you, as far as I can tell, doesn't actually shift the camera around when you stand back up. The more you know, right? Far more useful, though, is of course the ability to simply crouch. Finally and importantly, opening your inventory will usually reset the camera's vertical perspective. I say usually because this game is at least 90% well-polished bugs, but I'm not gonna get into that too much today. No, no, instead I'm gonna get into the remaining rules because of course the inability to aim in a first-person shooter just isn't bad enough. In addition to this, I decided that I wouldn't be using any unique gear nor anything of purple rarity or higher. This will be exclusively blue or more common. Why? Well, that's a great question and the answer is simple, because I can. I've also taken the liberty of banning melee because it's mapped to the right analog stick that I use to play the game. I don't want to risk moving the camera on accident. And while that's all well and good for normal mode run, this will instead be taking place on OP10. The footage you're seeing was more or less a test to see how things would go, and I'm not gonna lie, if I were to describe it in two words, I would say false hope. See, I would first need to locate all of my gear personally, as this is not a geared run. Also, I'll be playing as Maya. I felt that she would be a good balance between good enough to get me through this and not gauge to more or less just sidestep the challenge. Also, because Salvador can't ADS during Gunzerk, this feels like one of the few cases where he would legitimately be a bad option. Feels weird. Now with all of that out of the way, let's begin what was arguably one of the hardest runs that I've ever done, and that is saying a lot. I started by trying to get bully mongs and the bandits to fight one another to no success. The lack of gear wasn't helping things progress at all. Luckily, while I can't break Bullymong piles, they can. And even more luckily, out popped a sniper rifle. Green, but it'll do. Once I lived long enough to pick it up, I could get to killing. Using Maya's Ruin to inflict slag and Cloud Kill to deal damage, I was able to at least kind of pose a risk to the local Bullymong population. Emphasis on kind of, because second wins were extremely few and far between, as you can't ADS in fight for your life. For those less familiar, slag buffs all non-slag damage by a massive amount. Cloud Kill creates a 5 second long cloud of corrosive damage to any enemy you hit. The cloud doesn't move, and only one can be active, but that's enough for me. At least for now. Or it would be if shields weren't so helpful. Those are really nice to have. One of the hardest parts of the run throughout is just getting enemies in my crosshairs in the first place. Normally, there are these things called angles that allow for better shots at the enemies while also staying safe, but that's not really an option here. To turn around, I'd more often than not have to throw myself into a firefight in which I couldn't run effectively nor face my opposition. There are few prospects less enticing than trying to lure enemies into the correct position by way of one's own face. By the power of waiting a really long time, the bandits did eventually wander out of cover, and I seized my chance to strike repeatedly into their soft and supple flesh. That'll teach them for having a higher number of bones in their spine. While clearing the place out, I was able to locate a blue doll pistol, and as much as it pains me to say this, it was one of the best guns I would ever find. Soak it in, because this is as good as it's gonna get. After murdering my way through the Berg though, slowly and painfully having to focus down each and every moving foe, I was able to retrieve Sir Hammerlock to fix Claptrap's eye and make my way onward. At least this is the hardest section of the game, the rest should be easy. Uh... <laughs> a common tactic I would use when available would be to abuse the less aggressive enemies in any given environment. Trying to sidestep into a fight is horribly ineffective, but being able to face my foes from a distance was manageable. Despite this, sniper rifles pretty quickly fell out of favor for me. I don't really even have a solid reason outside of angles, but they helped a lot to get through the first part, but more or less only because there's a really large stretch of land between me and they. Next would come another fundamental strategy that would come into play in the form of cover. Undercover, cover up, cover letter, whatever you do or be, make sure cover comes before or after. Preferably both really, but this unfortunately isn't a cover shooter. In my case, it's more of a cover dire, but it helps it come on a lot slower, so we work with what we've got. 
In terms of settling things with the Boom Brothers, I was pretty darn concerned with handling Boom. More specifically, the giant missile turret. It might surprise you, but having large, unlimited, explosive munition devices directed straight at my head tends to make me nervous at the best of times, and me unable to see it is far from the best of times. Due to the angle I'd respawn, I was able to easily get cover upon re-entering the arena, but to what end? I could also use Boom to reposition myself, but survival still isn't... great? Overall, things were generally not going great, and I was wrestling a lot with the idea of dealing with the current nonsense while also putting up with an endless spawn of melee-centric enemies. I eventually settled on having one less ranged combatant to deal with, and with some specific planning and angle work, one of my favorite cheese spots once again came through for me. Now if only I could digest cheese to finally know what it tastes like grilled between bread with some butter lovingly melted on a pan. Why was I cursed with the ability to make that which I cannot eat? With some careful footwork, I was able to use the locals to take a new perspective on the problem. Frankly, I dare say that melee enemies were often an asset to the run as much as anything else. They would have to be dealt with before trying to handle Bertha though, because turning your back on anything in OP10 is usually a death sentence. After some more trial and error though, I was able to get to a safe perch from which I ran countless rounds over the course of a stress-fueled fight, hoping to best a man sitting in the world's largest booster seat. Following the idea though, of victory at any cost, our mutual fall would come shortly after. Honestly, worth it. Then would come time to use the cannon to... Oh. Um. Then it would come time to... So you can't move the cannon without using one of the banned methods, and you can't complete the objective without using the cannon to destroy the gate. So as I flailed helplessly at the problem, it became apparent that there just wasn't a way to do it. You can't beat Borderlands 2 without a neck. If you're a quitter! This run may be a nightmare, but so am I. And I may not be the sharpest of light bulbs in the pumpkin patch, but even I notice that the accuracy of the gun is inconsistent. Even more so while you're getting into the gunner seat. By getting out of the seat and back into it repeatedly, I was able to re-roll those chances to miss. Miss so badly that I hit my target, and it turns out when you pair really bad aim, the inability to aim, and bandit weaponry, well by god you get a recipe for how I hit most of my targets in a casual playthrough. Dumb luck. And just like that, the run continues. Now, I want to be clear that I was able to run from very, very few fights. The examples where I did and it didn't blow up in my face were rare to say the least. Even in the best cases, it was a really close call, but if we went over every single encounter in the game like I had to, we'd be here all day, so if your favorite totally random encounter doesn't get mentioned, just know that yes, it probably hurt me emotionally. I tried many of my usual strats, but often to little success. I do think I made my way into the space program, though. Determined to be lazy, I did find that the aggro ranges around the outside edge of the map are really weird and I was able to slip by. Still had to fight a bunch of enemies that are now behind me, but after several deaths, even they too would fall. Also, singularities are really nice. After clearing out a bunch of enemies, I was faced with one of the most difficult challenges before me. Moving in general. Given the option, I really wanted to avoid more combat, so I was intent on trying to get the usual skip working. And if I'm being honest, it probably would have been faster to just go the intended route, but after a lot of planning and patience, it too would prove manageable. Right before I died. Well, if you can do it once and all that. I do wish I could have repeated less of the run-up though, because new use stations seem a lot more spread out when you're traveling in the wrong direction. After countless deaths, literally, because counting them is far more trouble than it's worth, I finally made it back. Two who find that I had the angle entirely wrong, so I dropped back down to use an enemy to lower my angle and moved it slightly to the left. This was all that I needed to successfully pull a lever. To cut the long and painful story of the Flint fight short, I spent a really long time dying on loop trying to get far enough through the arena that I could lure him to absolutely any spot that he'd even be mildly cheesable. Having had little luck doing so, I saw an opportunity with a combination of fortuitous angle and enemies still being aggroed. Maya's convergibility is phenomenal for moving enemies around a bit, and a bit was all that I needed. For the unaware, Flint doesn't work correctly outside of his arena, and while I had to deal with a strangely high number of enemies down here, Flint was more or less defenseless, and the respawn station was even kind enough to give me a near-perfect angle to shoot him from. You could say that the pieces for this plan really fell into place. Next up was performing some basic repairs, which was easy as. What wasn't would prove to be turning vehicles. You sort of can by banging into terrain, but it's not reliable and not always applicable. Needing to get over a gap, I would first need to adjust my angle of approach by surviving a horde of Bolimong. Why didn't I just thin out the herd to make that easier? Great question. So I finally got the angle right to perform the grenade jump to the other side. In theory, not all that incredible a feat, but a feat I would accomplish nonetheless. It's a good thing that OP10 isn't incredibly dangerous, leading to me having to do this several times over due to repeat deaths. Why, that would have just been a dreadful experience all around. 
I did eventually get out of the place and went off to try pressing a button that was clearly a master of evasion. While trying to have a chat between Reese, some locals, and a group of Bullymongs, I would manage one of the excruciatingly few second wins for the run. While combat did become easier in some ways, in others it remained entirely the same, and one of the largest constants is that fights involving enemies all being in the same direction were the easiest to manage. You'll never guess why. But with that, I was finally ready to make my way into Sanctuary for the first time in the run. And I'm not sure why, but I was convinced that my life was about to get a lot easier. I was younger then. More naive. I had to really carefully position myself to be able to talk to Davis, because there's not exactly a lot I can do to turn here. Luckily the spawn angle is plenty to talk to him here and install the power core, or things would have gotten a lot more complicated. From there, I made my way in to talk to Scooter. I need to pick up two fuel cells to get Sanctuary up and running, much like any other playthrough. I initially thought that I could use the weird force pull trick that speedrunners use, and you can, but it won't work to pick up the cell behind me. For those unfamiliar, you can pick up items from a distance if you stand within their range of pickup, and keep the reticle on them the whole time you're moving away from them. You can also pick up a bunch of items at once by holding the pickup button. This though will pick up items near the initial point of pickup, not near you, so the force trick ain't gonna help at all. And trust me, I, I tried it enough times to know that much for sure. I then met with the man who made this whole run possible. I'm not sure if I should thank him or shoot him. He offers a mission that as you go into a shooting range with one of the only enemies in Sanctuary. As such, it's one of the only places I have to turn my camera at all. As you can see though, these pillars are great at putting a complete stop to that. But it's alright, I have a plan for that. For once, I did actually plan ahead with this run and did some labbing before I started, and some of the tech that I discovered here is what made me think starting this was a good idea at all. See, by killing the target and then aiming at the new one through the next window, I was able to further change my target angle, even in spite of the pillars. It's heavily ammo intensive, but it allows me a literal wider range of approaches to things. Problem is, it still just didn't turn me enough. Hitting the limit of what I could turn in there with normal methods, it just wasn't enough. See, when I did my tests, I completely forgot that there was one against the wall. I tried in vain some more with the force trick, and we already know that doesn't work. Testing my own sanity, I needed to be sure of something though. I needed to know that you could hold to pick up quest items in a group, so I did just that before resetting things. It proved that I only needed to pick up something near me. Anything but a piece of gear should work. I was pretty sure the booster shields wouldn't allow self damage to trigger a booster drop, but I was grasping at straws. They're the only thing that I could think of that would allow me to just spawn a pickup, and I couldn't quite reach anything to either my left or right. As it stood, I could reach a washing machine, but nothing inside it, nor the box to the opposite side of this accursed shelf. In theory, looking further down might work, but I couldn't figure out how to get a low enough angle while also looking left. For a peek into just how badly things were going, I went back to try the trick again. Many times, I was genuinely struggling trying and retrying anything and everything that I could think of. Due to some really weird janks surrounding the camera shake when you take damage or get hit by explosions, I was able to find what is quite possibly the least helpful tech in the entire game. I could shift my perspective just a tiny bit by using a grenade. I suspect it's due to how the reticle moves over the enemy when it shakes before returning to the same spot relative to your perspective. So while it moves your aim, it also doesn't. And so when I forced my actual perspective to move, it corrected it wrong. If that makes any sense. None of this makes any sense, this was a bad idea. Making my way back though, that too wasn't enough. So I tried the force trick again and it still didn't work. I did finally notice that aiming at enemies moves your reticle even when you're not aimed in. By carefully taking advantage of this, you can slowly move the camera through a series of jumps and slowly moving in the opposite direction that you're wanting it to shift. I was so desperate for just the slightest bit more movement that I was using the animation cycle of the Vandal's flailing legs to eke out the just tiniest bit further to the left. And you'll never guess, but it wasn't enough. It was never enough. I decided to retest the spawn locations. Truth be told, I only remember there being three on this map and that includes inside Marcus's shop later down the line. I completely forgot that there's one on the road to Sanctuary. Maybe it would spawn me at a slightly better angle. I know the map's initial spawn wasn't good enough. After forcing a respawn though, do I even need to say it? I was trying anything, just anything that I could think of. It just wouldn't work. Nothing would work. I looked for out of bounds spots online and in person. I tried rerolling the area over and over again, hoping that a block of four iridium would have our larger hitbox and allow me to pick it up, but no. I tried forcing a lower downward angle through grenade jumps, but I was fighting the ceiling the whole time and it was winning. Having exhausted pretty much everything I could think of, I reached out to some people that I admire for ideas, and I did receive one 
I learned quickly, though, that even if I could time a good fight for your life with the Vandal, it doesn't drift left or right when you stand back up. It recenters, kind of like how your accuracy cone works. It does shift down, but not enough. Ironically, I just didn't know where else to turn, so I guess you can't beat Borderlands 2 without a neck. If you're a goddamned quitter, because I had one more incredibly specific and obscure trick up my sleeve. It took me hours, literal hours in which I had no real proof if it was even possible, grasping at straws to piece together how, but I was so close. I'd already tried things like SMGs with their low accuracy to bump the reticle around and came to the conclusion that they were still just too tightly forward. Now, pickups have a small radius that you can pick them up from. It's incredibly small and precise. You can only really do it when you look directly at them until you look away. Once you look, there's a sort of grace window. The radius becomes much larger until you break it, and this may not seem like a huge change in size to you, but to me, well, I was too desperate to scoff at the smallest of changes, and the smallest is all that I would need. Because my last Borderlands run had a pretty bad case of wiggly camera, and when testing it out, of course, not every gun functions the same. I was testing their accuracy. I was testing their reload animations, but who the hell needs a reload when you've got a throw instead? So I farmed the vendors until I could get my hands on a TDR shotgun, and after hours of trying, it got my reticle in the radius just long enough. Just long enough to extend it outward to pick up my prize and finish one of the earliest missions in the game. Also, aiming lower is super easy with Marcus's shop for the purpose of installing them. That wasn't even remotely a problem. Through it all, I needed to fund things somehow, so I spent a fair bit of time just going to Moxie to tip her for money. It may cost literally thousands, but once per load of the map, she'll give you a gun that will sell for millions. So one of the upsides to this difficulty is it's pure profit. During that farming, though, I ran into Michael not once, but twice. Both times giving me genuinely incredible gear for my forward progress. But that's still not all, because when I finally got done with what felt like a labor of Heracles, he was waiting right there to congratulate me. The story behind Michael being here at all is far from a happy one. I can't say that I ever knew him personally, but I think there's something poetic about the fact that when a run pushed me so hard that I reached out for help, well, here he was, ready to lend a hand to a vault hunter in need. Afterwards, against all odds and against all reason, this area full of enemies and at least a fair few turns was one of very, very few places that I got to just run through. I did die a handful of times, but given how many deaths occurred pretty much everywhere else, this was basically nothing. You love to see it. What you don't love to see, though, is the success rate of the skip. Trying to figure out where I was relative to anything via the minimap was more than I wanted to do with these bumbling movement speeds, so I ended up just walking along the railing, because that's somehow easier than locating myself in space without the ability to turn. I finally made it to the section in which I really hoped that Lilith could help. She didn't really, but I hoped she could. For the most part, though, mobs aren't as bad as you might think. I might be squishy, but relatively speaking, so were they. I can usually trade my life one-to-one -one in these conflicts. There are, of course, exceptions to this, and I made ample use of the jump glitch that caused the melee enemies to just not really function correctly. Because trying to kill two badass melee units sounded like a bad time when I can't even pretend that I can outmaneuver them. At the end of it all, though, I couldn't quite reach the box at the end to help Lilith. I tried going backwards to use enemies to reorient myself, but ended up just rerunning the map instead. It was honestly easier than trying to figure out where the beams were backwards. I couldn't even align my little arrow with the damn thing on the minimap to know where I was. Luckily, I can use the main map to figure out where I was ahead of time, and I was chasing that double-edged sword that is progress. It fuels us, keeps us moving through the pain. The accomplishment that washes away every moment poisoned with failure, but at what cost? Every next step is rewarded with an agony that must be suffered to know the joy of success, but it must be suffered. It must be endured not because we should, but because we can. As luck would have it, the following car section points you very nearly directly at the intended target. I was able to alert the nearby enemies of my desire to enter their stronghold, much to no avail. I would instead make my way to the dust, and it may not have been clean or comfortable, but destroying their toys is at least relatively easy on OP-10 because the devs don't know how to balance things properly. I just needed to repeat my previous car escapades. They got a bit off track with the skag in the way, but in the same fashion they were more on point than ever. By getting out and in, you can change the angle of the car quite well, and that I did. For the guardian of these not-so-sacred chambers, I would implement a strategy of conflict resolution called staying out of his effective range and shooting him to trigger cloud kill. It's a lengthy name, but it also doubles as a description. Making my way inside, though, I accidentally attempted to turn my lack of neck, causing me to die instantly. I can take the thumbsticks off of my controller, which makes it easier to not do on accident, but it's not impossible. It's still got a little nub that was unfortunately easy to tap without thinking. 
Believe it or not, I do have at least a couple of good habits that I'm fighting here. Inside. Inside. So the respawn has you at a right angle to any of the enemies that can and will try at your limited time in this earthly realm. Melee and its approaching me were vital to accomplishing much of anything because I can't comfortably approach anyone. Much like real life, actually. Except where my day-to-day -day is plagued by social incompetence, my current situation is more bullet-based. Despite having theoretically ideal conditions for combating the remaining ranged foes, I often found myself dying. So while the close range to turning dummies made my life a bit harder at times, I was also far more than hesitant to be rid of them. Thanks to Michael, though, I was able to do a somewhat respectable amount of damage moving forward into a closer ranges. And after clearing out enough of them, I felt that I had a large enough window to book it, and I made it to the dreaded toilet room. I was able to make use of the gap that enemies jump to handle exactly one dunk. Which is still better than nothing, but I was really hoping I could use it to handle some of the enemies that came after. Instead, I mostly relied on tactical retreats and phase walking to slowly whittle enemies down. But the problem was not down, it was up. To get to the remaining enemies in the room, I needed to get all the way to the top without dying before being able to get a better view of things because I have no way to just look up at the moment. So I died over and over again trying desperately just to make a dent in their numbers. Once I got my proverbial foot in the door, it was all smooth sailing. But in terms of how, I just had to wait for enemies to get close enough and hope for the best. I spent a while here. The next area was complicated as my main means of turning around was a badass psycho that came from the hall on the left. So he only sort of aggroed to me, but I needed him to see everyone else. And I really hope I don't have to explain why he was otherwise a substantial issue. This whole thing was a really weird balancing act. It was one that I eventually made though, and when I finally saw my chance, I took it. I took it and ran to find Roland. It's been a long time since I was so happy to see him. I'm not really sure what this guy was feeling. I can only imagine that this is him trying to convey some sort of emotion. Maybe a celebratory dance or something? I can't say I'm familiar enough with his culture, but it seemed somewhat threatening. Wanting to not spend a second longer than I had to, I then ran straight through while Jack and his loaders tore the bloodshots. A strategy that wouldn't extend to the dam. This place is mostly linear, so it wasn't too bad, but I was under no illusion that I'd be able to make it through cleanly. Okay, maybe a more minor illusion. Luckily, it just turns you entirely backwards. Because that makes sense. Aside from the typical woes, this place was fine. It helps that most of the enemies are weak to my main damage type. All the way up until the main reason I'm here, and I'm facing exactly opposite of my problem. Now, while some enemies kind of pull your reticle around, constructors do so a lot. It's genuinely hard to get them more centered because aim assist can and will actively push the camera away in an attempt to compensate for what the player is probably doing. When that's all I'm using though, it makes it way harder than it needs to be to just aim at the damn thing. This, while it spawns in a bunch of enemies, as it tends to do, and I'm gonna level with you, the more enemies I faced, the more overwhelmed I became. I, I need to focus on one thing at a time, and even trying to fight two was more than enough to spread out my damage to be unwinnable numbers. With exploders and badasses coming in, things were looking pretty rough. I needed survivability and constant damage to burst the thing down before the mobs could do the same to me. If you've been here a while, you might recognize this little spot, and it isn't perfect. But I don't need it to work every time. I just need it to work once. By standing behind the car for cover, I am able to hit the constructor and use it to soak up bullets when I need it. Convergence keeps most enemies away from me, so as long as I'm not getting exploders or badasses, everything can and will work out fine. This run isn't so much about foolproof strategies as finding ones that will work just well enough. Just slipping through the cracks enough times to win. Next would come wakey time for our resident sniper, which is always free. The first bomb I had to steal was weirdly easy to acquire, basically just popped in and took it. Well, they responded by popping some rounds in me, so I had to come back for the second. Should be easy. Just gotta go in, grab the thing, and... What the hell happened? I don't feel so good. Oh well. Just gotta go in, grab the stuff for Tina. I need to look into a new line of work. Just as soon as I figure out how to turn toward it. Placing the bombs is also a lot easier than you think. Climbing ladders is a lot more generous than I would have given credit for before this, so I was able to check that off in no time, and before I knew it, well, it was time for Wilhelm. My first thought, of course, was to just cheese the fight, but something about not being able to maneuver well in any capacity just, uh, well, put a damper on things. I then tried the other cheese spot, and it went just as poorly. So I killed all the loaders, changed absolutely nothing else, and it worked perfectly. Wilhelm is... Such a weird fight. After grabbing the new power core, I stumbled my way back to Sanctuary. After a really awkward conversation and some really weird angles on some routine maintenance, I ran into the shooting range to lower my angle while everything and everyone was getting blown up. 
Frankly, I feel that one of the many people running around could and should have assisted in some way for a more timely response. It did make it doable for me at least, and despite the general panic, things went fine. Until Lilith teleported me facing away from the zone transition. You're lucky I can save quit to just leave the area or we'd be having some words right now. This run did contain even more foot travel than I'm used to, and while it's nice to not be locked in combat under these restrictions, it's also nerve wracking knowing that I have no meaningful way to defend myself against a lot of encounters and if I die, I have to run the whole way again, probably sideways or backwards. Case in point, I needed to clear some of them out to get to the door, but I, you know, don't do a lot in combat, so I died several times, and the nearest new you ain't exactly close. When all was said and done, I was just glad to find a means by which to reorient myself. Against all odds, the bridge was fine, and yes, I'm aware that it can be skipped, but all things considered, the ranges in which you can interact with things were generous here. And genuinely, it wasn't that bad. I did more or less have to use the crane though. You hate to see it, but I just couldn't move quickly enough for the bridge. Luckily, the same can't be said for the constructor section. Was I capable of living a long and healthy life in this body afterwards? No. Was I able to resume being alive on the other side, not having to put up with a constructor? Absolutely. 100% worth it by my calculations. I didn't expect the Thresher fight after to go well, but between the loaders pulling its aggro and me being left to just pour bullets into the thing, well, I've had worse in my casual playthroughs. Didn't even really move. The Highlands are too big. That's it, that's my note for here. This place is too large. As for the actual mission here, I tried. I genuinely tried, but it mostly just boiled down to me repeatedly repairing the beacon for reasons that I really hope are obvious by now. At the end of it all though, I was able to finally go home. Right after performing the camera trick with Marcus to open the door, because from here on out, every single visit to the Crimson Raiders HQ requires that I change my approach to be able to get inside. What you need, Morty? It was a long way here and I got bored. You need me to only kind of hurt a lot of enemies? Don't worry, that's my specialty. Just as easy as cloud kill and converge, that just leaves the rest of the preserve. Oh boy. So entering the first area being a struggle wasn't an experience that I needed. Ended up once again having to actually fight enemies that I usually don't give the time of day. Getting deeper into the place, I found not one, but two rabid stalkers, and you might think that they could be lured out to help with all of this nonsense like I did. Only very kind of, and it wasn't really worth the effort. Between the Ultimate Stalker and the Ultimate Loader, things were relatively alright, if a bit exceedingly long-winded. With that success fueling things, I was pretty content handling the rest. Sure, there's a lot that can make my life harder, but the Loader fight tends to be the benchmark for me in terms of just how readily and happily I'll be handling the area. So with that done, even things like Corrosive Skags weren't that intimidating. All that was left was a big old bird. I started by just using the usual. I figured, why not? Well, it was probably just me being off my game, but I was struggling to hold her still. It probably didn't help that I was struggling to line up any way of damaging her while doing so. I wasn't too worried about the corrosive phase, despite most of my damage coming from cloud kill. But I did end up dying quite a few times, which led to me changing my strategy a bit. I started trying to stay on the opposite side of the arena relative to where I was facing so I could sprint in any direction to better avoid her dive bombs. But even in spite of troubles, well, she's still just a bird after all. Despite more or less being forced to watch the consequences of my actions by the choices I've made, not everyone must be, so I'm moving on. I stumbled back to give Claptrap his upgrade, and despite not giving him a high five, well, it ain't turning your back on friends if you can't turn your back. I refuse to play this place correctly, so running was indeed the name of the game. I like Thousand Cuts from a design perspective, but I'm also lazy. And despite what you might think, the usual parkour proved to be extremely doable. I thought it'd pose at least somewhat of a larger challenge, but nah. After recruiting the usual suspect, he was off to do my bidding for me. Didn't end up finishing the job, but close enough. Anything that I don't have to do is one more thing that I don't have to do. Despite seeing me work though, Brick was fully on board working with me. Seems ill-advised, but you know what they say about gift horses. I did have to actually help him kill things, but it was nice not being the center of attention on the battlefield. Or in general. I can't say that I was looking forward to opportunity, because that would be a lie. I was looking to the right of opportunity. I would approach the problem from various angles, mostly spanning the polar ends of about 180 degrees. After clearing out pretty much all of the enemies around the area, I spent a fair bit of time trying to get Jack to around a circle for me so I could shoot him because his AI is somehow dumber than this challenge. I didn't need to kill him, I just needed to break his shield. And after entirely too long, that's exactly what I did. But that wasn't good enough, so after dying, I did it again, but this time via some mildly excessive range for the poor coward. For those who are unaware, some substantial damage done to him will cause him to reposition entirely, which means dealing with new enemies and his still constant health regen. 
And I'm not sure what triggers it, but for your dedication to killing him here and now, your reward for continuing to push forward is him returning from whence he came. And for whatever reason, the majority of the time he comes back here, his AI just stops functioning at all, and I may not do incredible damage, but Cloud Kill is more than enough to overcome the Body Devil's health regen when immobile. As for the info kiosks, they're super easy. 90 degree angle at a crouching stance, so they were very much run in and out scenarios. I also managed to find my way to the under tunnel very quickly. I have a hard time locating it when I can see, so I was genuinely concerned. Evidently, without good reason, but it was weight off my shoulders knowing that it was done. Next up was one of the encounters of all time. To say this was unpleasant would be like saying that Salvador is a sort of strong character. Respawns would all face me away from a turret that'd be shooting me in the back the entire time, all while trying to approach loaders that I also face away from, ones that deal a lot of damage very quickly. All capped off by a constructor that would guarantee both that I die and that there is no shortage of enemies to make it happen faster. I died to exploders, missiles, cliffs, warloaders, missiles again. I just I really don't like this section at the best of times. The cover here is garbage. The spawns are countless. I can't stand this place or the things in it. You want a good way to handle this? Because there really isn't one. Good would imply that it's not a crock of shite. Would I recommend walking your way backward onto the pipe that we normally choose this thing from via a higher location to have a chance of actually killing it? Yeah, but only after you turn it around because there isn't a lot of hope any other way. This run has a way of just feeling claustrophobic and that you can see everything happening, but only sort of. You can struggle against the game, but only sort of. You have the ability to progress and thrive, but only sort of. You don't truly have the ability to move. You can't do so many things that you take for granted in any other run, and it's just so frustrating being so close. So damned close to being able to accomplish any given task, but knowing that the game always has different plans. In some ways, I love that tasks like this take me back to the fundamentals. I've got to rethink just about everything. In others, well, it's humbling to find out just how lacking a specific skill is when you no longer have another to lean on. Avoiding mortars may be inconsistent, but it's very doable. As for what came after, the loaders along the path are good for moving the camera up a bit via phase lock. Everything seems great, right? Well, these turrets are predictably a nightmare. Even at the lowest level they can spawn, I can't damage them in any meaningful way. They just recover health faster than I can deal damage on account of them being entirely immune to cloud kill. So I tried switching it up with a corrosive SMG, and still nothing. This may look like progress, but what you're seeing is Reaper in motion. I deal a lot more damage to enemies with half of their health or better. As soon as it hits that point, it's all over. For those that don't know, enemies three levels or more above your level take reduced damage, and the damage reduction is directly tied to the gap between you. In other words, higher level means more health and less hurdy numbers. So it might be possible to find the right gear combination to make this possible, but try as I might, I just couldn't find any blue gear that could handle this door. So that's kind of that, isn't it? If you're afraid of blatantly exploiting glitches. So I searched high and low exclusively in vendors for a low capacity shield and an assault rifle that deals self damage. By spawning in cars and then breaking my own shield, it would trigger a skill from Maya called Backdraft. It's a little hard to make consistent with this setup, but Backdraft detonating deals one big pop of fire damage and then a DOT like a Nova shield. If the initial pop destroys player spawned vehicles, and it has to be the initial pop, then not only will it trigger Maya's kill skills, but they last indefinitely. Sort of. Indefinitely enough for my purposes, and they also stack. Maya has at least a handful, but I only need two here. One that makes me effectively immune to bullets for comfort reasons, and one that improves both my shield regen and my reload speed. It's not a trick that I wanted to use, but, well, it's entirely within the rules. I don't need a camera to break the game in half. Between reflecting their own shots at them, a crazy fast reload, and the same corrosive SMG, well, it was plenty. Just because I could, I swapped over to an amp shield that becomes significantly stronger with my constant health regen, and was rather chuffed to find that the twin turret was indeed exactly that. The poor thing even spawned matching the lowest possible spawn level. Being fueled by one of the most powerful bugs in the game, I would of course... What? Really? Is that even legal? What's the point of shields if glitches don't even make them viable? So, with an unfortunately somehow still large amount of pain and suffering, I eventually managed to make my way to my usual spot. This is stupid. Also, as a side note, assault rifles that deal self-damage aren't exactly common or cheap. I spent a long while farming the resources necessary to purchase one, as well as the vendors to get one to spawn, and 
what should I find but two almost identical ones just sitting here in a box? Because why not? After safe quitting to remove the bug because it felt unfair to keep using it if I didn't absolutely need it, I made my way toward the bunker. It's a good thing that I've spent several hours of my life here learning the place like the back of my hand so that I wouldn't need to see where I'm... We're not talking about that. What we are talking about is these auto turrets. They're incredibly manageable as the ones in the ground are easily shot with circle strats. As for the rest, I've got infinite loaders to get more obscure angles. Easy as. Moving on to the big old bastard of the hour. Or before we get to that, power loaders. Do you by chance remember near the very beginning of the video when I mentioned that there are exceptions to the rule when it comes to aim assist and how it works? Well, power loaders deflect bullets, so the camera being pulled to the center of mass makes no sense. It would make them actively harder to hit in their vulnerable bits, which is more or less the opposite of what it's there for. So instead, it just doesn't work at all. Super neat, huh? Works really nicely when I need to face an enemy that attacks me down here. Isn't at all stressful. Well, nothing else to be done. Better get a good angle on the flying... You bastard! You did this! Oh, oh, it's my fault, you say? Just because I'm the one controlling the game? Well, what if I told you that the bunker also can't be locked onto? Its turrets kind of can, but its swaying will actively push your camera away from good angles to shoot it a lot of the time. It's still my fault, you say, and not even related to my inability to stay above cliffs? Well, counterpoint. There. Now don't you feel foolish. What? What do you mean I'm still the fool here? You're not even responding. You're just sitting there listening to me lose my mind. Who even wrote this script? What do you mean I did? Well, screw you, me. I'm going off script. I'm not even going to give you the satisfaction of knowing what I'm going to say here. Oh. Oh, oh no. I, I don't know what to say here, man. I, d I just work here. I, I don't know. Oh, God. I, I really didn't. I thought I'd think of something. I don't know what to say. Help. So that was probably one of the worst ideas that went into making this video a reality. Anyway, I often made my way back here to shoot it when it was ironically closer. This was mostly due to the poor possible angles that could be achieved with it pushing my view around, and also the fact that I desperately wanted to be facing this direction when it went into its last phase. It did mean risking more cliff-based interactions each time I went back, but it was worth it. I may not have a neck, but I still have a spine. In spite of how long it took, and how much time was spent mostly just waiting for it to get into a nice spot, I was eventually able to not only get it into the final phase of its life, but I was able to safely approach it. Using the loaders above me, I was able to get the turns in that I needed to face a bit more favorably toward my foe. And despite not having a good shot, because I was terrified of upsetting the local loaders any more than I already had, I was in business. Try not to be too jealous with just how smoothly things were going with these absolutely massive takes of damage. Yeah, so I spent the rest of its life just using phase lock to deal all my damage. The game ain't too picky where you point it, and I was absolutely going to use that to my advantage, because any time spent here is too long. After finding out that the respawn points you in absolutely the wrong direction to go downward, I made my way back up to find some loaders who were kind enough to tell me where to go. Regrettably, and rather tired, I ended up just taking the elevator down normally. I was fairly sure I'd have to go back up to adjust my camera angle, but it turns out that you can enter this one from pretty much any angle you want. Also luckily, the game points you in the exact direction of the button to get into Angel Core, so death has no real repercussions. After confirming that I could damage the injectors via Singularity Grenade, all doubt was washed away. Next was just a lot of mobbing. Or so I thought. The defense turrets were really useful for looking upward to destroy the injectors, but they're also really annoying to have around. But worse than annoying, they seem broken. They don't seem to be affected by cloud kill, but they can also double up. If you look closely here, that is not one turret. And because they overlap, they sometimes take bullets for each other. Meaning my pitiful gun damage isn't even nearly enough to break them both. I need one to sit still long enough for me to kill it without the other interfering, all while not dying in this hell pit. How does this game just continue to find new ways to vex me? You've heard can't be in two places at once, but there are two things that can occupy the same space at the same time, and I won't stand for this affront to physics. Otherwise, it was a very standard affair. Kill anything that moves, ask ethical questions when I feel like it, I guess. Right up until I found that the injector was entirely invulnerable. There just wasn't anything that I could do, even by cheating, so I made what is likely a very controversial decision. I just used the camera to redo all of Angel Core. The whole section resets if you save quit, so I did that, completed it, and then did it again to reset my camera for fairness. I did absolutely everything to complete every objective, and the game just broke, so if it's not going to play fairly, why should I? 
Well, that little maneuver cost me a Roland, and I didn't see where Lilith went, but mercifully the game spawns you in the right angle to hop out of Marcus's shop. I've been thinking I was going to have to bust out the T-Door shotgun again, and yes, I'm still hanging on to it just in case. I was then tasked with not just walking across all of the dust, because that would be far too easy, I then had to cross the Iridium Blight. Both absolutely massive maps, just to be told to go elsewhere. Freaking door not even facing me in the right direction. So what can be said about Sawtooth that hasn't been already? Things in really inconvenient spots for me specifically? Sure. I guess. But what about the really weird looking enemy totems? You might even be able to see them in their weird towery ways if the section of the video survives YouTube compression and also the sheer amount of on-screen numbers. Because while I love jumping numbers, and this makes my brain very happy, I do understand that this can also be overwhelming for somebody else to see. Next came a section that... Well, I haven't struggled here in longer than I can recall, but this place is a nightmare. There are some enemies that are really resistant to what I can do, a lot of enemies in general, and I'm facing the wrong direction to take on most of them. Death was my main companion through here, and not to pick up my deliveries this time. I slowly chipped away at the numbers of the place, before making my way to their courtyard of killing. You may feel that you're missing out in not seeing more of the conflict, but it was just me dying repeatedly, and I mean repeatedly. Trust me, it's not even entertaining unless you're purely here to watch me suffer, in which case, why should I indulge you? Has there not been enough? After finally getting through, I was more or less forced to watch Boombringer blow up because I couldn't move or turn or even live. Frankly, the whole situation was unfair, but after making my way to the elevator, it was time. Time to face my destiny. Time to face the wrath of a thousand screaming eagles. Or I guess these buzzard-based bozos will do. I used a melee enemy to complete the monumental task of turning around to face the greatest threat of all. Reality. It may look very virtual to you, but this... Well, this was the reality of the buzzard's nest, and do you see how much damage I'm doing to the buzzards? But Spuddy, I hear you say. You're not dealing any damage to the buzzards in this clip. In fact, you're not really even aiming at them. Exactly. That... That was basically the whole experience. Fact of the matter is, even aside from trying to survive them, I just couldn't keep my camera on them long enough to do anything, because I need to reload, and they heal crazy fast. And of course, fly all over the place. They can and will break and eventually get stuck in one place, which would allow me to beat them, but that's both inconsistent and just... it takes forever. Frankly, the run was already taken a bit, as you might be able to guess, and I just didn't really see the value in waiting for that to happen. So I broke the game again and became death itself. Just, uh, well, know that this section is going to have a lot of flashing lights. I want you to be safe. So if you're sensitive to that sort of thing, or honestly, even if you're not, I'd advise avoiding eye contact with the bastard that I'm about to knock out of the sky until further notice. This is going to be really rough. I'm literally only leaving this here for the sake of showing the hardiest of viewers what I went through. Looking away? Your eyes are nice and safe? Good. And let's do this. Named after the noble bird, these buzzards are but scavengers within the wastes that they call home. Pitiful compared to the real thing, they are beholden to no land, and give not to its majesty. They are nothing but a scourge upon those that inhabit a better place than they within the world. But the concept of reload times are optional to one such as I, and bullets come in a seemingly endless supply. The first and last mistake you've made was getting in my way, and now the only question you've left to pose is which will be louder. The screaming wreckage of your vessel, or the mangled husk that will be left within when this dance between us is finished. Step quickly now, for it's time for me to lead, and you merely to trip. Okay, you can look now. And, uh, to anyone that actually saw that, if your head isn't hurting now, consider that this run took around 28 hours of playtime. I got to the point that I had to turn some valves, and I ended up having to take a route that I literally don't remember taking even once in all the years that I've played this. I didn't even know this was here. The valves are also a bit low, but the enemies are happy to help, and I'm happy to receive their help, so it all works out. I had some doubts about my own strat working with the current difficulties, but it turns out that enemies still usually won't aggro if you go through the top correctly, which is a really nice change of pace. I'm kinda used to my typical shenanigans only sort of working through this run. I got to revel in the fact that jump damage is allowed for the first time ever in this run, and also the fact that a car was weirdly easy to crash into the right direction to then crash into a pipe to proceed. It's funny how many things genuinely just fell into place, and how many things just kinda sorta worked, but also not really. Like, why were the turrets before the bunker still one of the most dangerous and overall impassable threats on Pandora? As for Saturn, yes, 
Thanks to a pup skag, this was a run that I killed it safely from inside a cabin that I'm cutting away from to avoid even more flashing lights because that thing bombs the inside of the structure like the average Axon player bombs everything. The answer was single firing for cloud kill and just waiting. I then fought my way across a bridge which had a weirdly high number of RPG loaders. I struggled to fight or flee from the constructor, so I fought it and this really annoying surveyor from a really long way away. The only risk to my safety here is its bullet deflection shield because its nukes, missiles, heat seekers, and lasers all just can't reach this far. You can theoretically use distance against more constructors, but setup is often a disaster with easier methods available. With it destroyed, I used a series of singularities to buy myself time to steal a map. With that done, and nearing the final stretch, I was set up perfectly. The section of the game points you straight at the objective in a straight line, so dying only makes me more powerful. The distance means even minor adjustments work as a cute option to lock on to anyone and everyone. What I didn't account for is that apparently the turrets just don't spawn in if you're too far away from them when they're, you know, supposed to. And then if you walk toward them after Claptrap was supposed to have already gotten control of them, they will spawn in, but not fighting for our side. So walking forward just made things demonstrably worse. Not by a lot, but this really didn't need to get worse. After carefully padding my way to Brick though, well, he's like a big huggable safety blanket. Everything just feels more okay with him here. Eh, still better than it could be. It did occur to me though, I've taken my basic movement for granted for years. I was questioning my ability to do even the most basic maneuvers, and this mission included a mandatory jump. If I wasn't facing further left, I might be entirely screwed, and with Brick actively killing my assists, I needed to act quickly. Not that quickly, because it's OP-10, and I could just die on the other side of the bridge, but with the most, and also only, helpful RPG loader I've ever seen, I was set up and ready to jump. Were I to fail this though, well, I just wasn't sure what I might do. But as fate would have it, I would clear it on the first try. Yeah, I'm hyping up a basic jump. It's been a long run and this video is long enough that I'm going to add a moment that made me happy. Fight me. But like, only if you're going to throw the fight, because I'm not looking for any sort of violence. I used an enemy to turn around and tactically retreat to some safety rocks that allow me to then destroy an otherwise invulnerable turret, because Maya is cool like that. I then ran as fast as my feet would carry me to a new U, because checkpoints are valuable. I wouldn't have that kind of luck for the next section, because there are a lot of turns and there's no way that a grenade jump across would leave me in a good spot. So I used a singularity grenade to give myself a better shot at turning toward the enemies and turning their insides into their outsides. Mmm, melty. Using enemies against the enemies may seem a bit obtuse, but I stand by that it was the right call. Which is ironic, because I needed just a slight tilt downward to use OSHA compliant safety railing to best a robot that has more guns than I have limbs. Despite accidentally killing all of the enemies in the previous encounter, I quickly and safely found another enemy to assist my direction into instead just sprinting to the end of Hero's Pass because constructors suck. With the map loading position pointing me basically straight at the elevator button, it was clearly meant to be. This was definitely an intentional design and the developers did this on purpose like all of the other weird and obscure features in the game, like being able to use money shot on the infinity. But finally, I would just have two bosses left. I would begin fighting Jack by isolating him because I ain't about all those clones and eventual robots. Turns out that I should have been looking out for raves and breakdancing. I'm just not as young as I used to be and I was blown away by his moves. Literally. I'm dead now. I tried for a while very unsuccessfully to fight him, which I knew was in vain. And he knew was in vain. But you didn't know it was in vain. You, you do now, but you didn't then. After being thrown into lava one too many times, which is even one time, I knew what I had to do. I did know before that, but if there was any doubt, then he sealed his fate with that little maneuver. So I fought him until his AI stopped working like it always does for reasons that I don't understand and will only praise for my purposes. It's a really handy little thing to have, and I'm not sure of any other pacifist runs that could be done for this game anyway, so it's not like it's going to hurt them. I started the warrior fight by throwing myself into lava to show Jack that only I'm allowed to do that. It definitely wasn't an accident as far as you can prove in a court of law, and the warrior countered by throwing me into lava. I'm really not sure what everyone's obsession with the hobby is, but this is getting ridiculous. While getting into a better spot to fight the big ugly thing, I found a crystal disc that disagreed with physics and I think it won? I think a living creature finally just beat physics. It was hostile for a little while longer, but it was good to keep around for turning. When it de-aggroed permanently, I was over the moon. Or I guess under it since we saved Elpis. Either way though, while I can't lock onto it, I can just move around the creature to change where I'm aiming. The warrior can barely attack me here at all, so with that, it was mostly just a matter of time. If you look carefully over there though, you can see a rack hanging out just over there because I was slowly collecting animal friends who hung out with me for the fight. With them by my side, I was able to finally and mercifully kill the warrior in the same way that I killed Saturn, just mostly saving ammo and spacing shots. 
I was able to easily call the moonshot, and all that was left was Jack. And I may not be able to spin, but I'm pretty sure that's at least a 360 degree rotation on the spot, and I killed Jack without even needing a scope. And just like that, I... Wait, wait, hold on a minute. I... Huh. So I reloaded the area, threw a singularity to aggro a rack, used phase lock to hold it still, and used it to look down a little bit so I could pick up a vault key and beat Borderlands 2 without a neck. Thus proving that controller is better than mouse. It's so good that you don't even need to aim. You just need a lot of incredibly obscure knowledge about the game, an incredible amount of spare time, and you need to just... Yeah, maybe, maybe just stick to whatever method you're most comfortable with. I can't in good faith recommend this to anybody. It's so bad. It's just so bad. But regardless, I'd like to thank my lovely channel members for your continued support. Your kindness is a reassurance that helps immensely in times that I begin to truly understand the ramifications of just how stupid something I've committed to completing turns out to be. Regardless of who you are though, I hope you enjoyed your time here. Try not to take basic things like movement for granted, because it's incredible just how much harder things become without it. You probably know how to use social media, and I hope that means we'll get to hear your thoughts now and on any future writings. Until then, remember to stay safe, spread some kindness in the world, and I hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.